every organization has a why. There's and and everyone in the organization should be able to articulate why an organization exists. When we think about higher education, it's often sharing knowledge with the world, or there's going to be some statement, some missional objective that we all have and, and that we get behind. We realize that the reason we show up for work every day is that. From a security perspective, then you've got to think about where does security fit in that organizational mission? What is the purpose of security related to getting the job of the job done? Security isn't in and of itself an end. It's not, the purpose of security isn't security. The purpose of security is to enable a business to do what a business needs to do in such a way that the business remains resilient in all the areas that it cares about in terms of resilience of supporting its community, uh, resilient in supporting its stakeholders, resilient in being able to continue doing what it does, even if a security event occurs, right? So when we're thinking about talking to leadership or um, explaining why security is important, you've got to think of it in those areas. Now, different kinds of organisations have different fundamental underlying whys. You might think that, for example, a healthcare organisation, a hospital, their why is going to be tied to patient health. Um, the why of a retail organisation might be tied to um, product sales. Um, the why of a university, again, might be tied to the development of students and student achievement. So thinking about how does security help that? And you're not going to be talking about vulnerability management and patching and endpoint whatever. You're going to be talking about it at a much higher level than that. So um, th there is an art to that. Uh, and, and that's what security leaders and people who are tasked with security need to be able to learn that art. When you're trying to do security in a public sector organization or a nonprofit organization, one of the things that comes to mind for me is the concept that Wendy Nather coined quite some time ago, which is the security poverty line. And the security poverty line isn't just about do we have the budget for security? It also contains elements like do we have the expertise in our organization to do security well? Do we have the culture all the way through the organization that supports doing security well? Um, do we have the resources, of course? And then do we have the capabilities in our operational processes to do security well? So when we think about the security poverty line, there are a number of verticals, a number of industries that seem to be above the, the poverty line. They have the resources and the expertise and the organizational structures and so on, which is why as a security industry, we tend to look at financial sector as being an example of an industry above the poverty line, particularly big banks, but even smaller banks sometimes struggle with this, the regional banks and so forth struggle with this a little bit. But when we look at the public sector, more often than not, everyone in the public sector or the nonprofit sector falls in some way below that poverty line, right? So we may have the funds, but we don't have the expertise. We may have the funds and the expertise, but we don't have the cultural support and so on. So uh, that makes doing security in higher eds, K through 12, state and local government, nonprofits, really challenging. And a lot of the effort right now industry-wide is for those kinds of organizations Rather than going it alone, how do we collaborate as community to address those gaps and be able to share the knowledge or expertise or resources or culture across groups, across organisations, so that we can collectively be successful? So I've now had the joy of of walking into new organizations and evaluating what they're doing from a security perspective. And 
one of the things that is true is it's it's not about only it's not only about what tools they have or the functions that they're supporting and so forth there's a bigger picture analysis that needs to happen so one is you have to go in and understand first and foremost what is the culture of the organization because culture eats strategy for breakfast every single day so if the culture supports security you're already ahead of the curve when we work with public sector in particular we often find that the culture isn't quite there yet. So thinking about things like, is there cultural questions? Is there a general sense that security is important amongst leadership, but also amongst people who are the day-to-day workers of the organisation? Yes or no? Is there an awareness of the kinds of security elements uh, and and trends that might impact this particular organisation? Yes or no. Do people in the organisation understand what they need to do to personally secure themselves and their families? And do they bring that understanding with them into the office? Those kinds of cultural questions. Really easy ones to ask in the first 90 days of someone taking on a, a new program. And then based on the answers you get, you sort of know where you are on the curve, right? If the answer is no, no, and no, well, you've got to start with some basic awareness. You've got to start with talking to leadership about how they can start to incorporate security into their world, right? So that's culture. Then you get into things like, do we have general expertise? And I'm not talking about just the security teams, because often we don't have a security team. Is there expertise in the people who do their job, whether they're finance people or teachers or uh, students or whatever, is there expertise in them knowing how to do their job in a secure way? Do they have that? Um, then, of course, if you have security people, are there is there expertise in the security space? So there's this general sort of expertise question that you can evaluate too, and then you have. Um, also very important, you have a question about how does the organization run? In an organization that's very process driven, it can be easy to, as a security person, to evaluate those processes and make incremental improvements to make those processes more secure. But if you're working for a very small organization or a startup or an organization that's super distributed where there isn't a change management process. There isn't an onboarding process for new employees. There isn't, you know, these core fundamental processes that larger organizations tend to have. If you don't have that, then there's nothing to inject security into. So so now you feel like you've got to invent onboarding for employees. Isn't that an HR function? Or you've got to invent change management for IT. Isn't that an IT function? What Like, why does security have to do it? Um, And you have to then, as the person responsible for security, to say, this isn't really a security thing, but if it's not there, we can't be secure either. So you've got now got to influence the organisation to get some structure around the way they do things. And it's still okay to be distributed or centralised or whatever, but those processes in the distributed units have to be visible to what you're doing centrally. So these are some of the things that you can evaluate as a new person coming into an organization uh, and and then knowing okay it is what it is this is where i'm starting from and not killing yourself trying to be best of the best of the best when those things don't even exist to start with so when you're talking to your organizational leaders you're chief financial officers or the person who's in charge of the budget or what, whatever you, whatever titles they have, department heads, right? When you're talking to them, the first thing you've got to understand is what they think is important because if you can't centre security in terms of their objectives, you're going to miss the boat. So when you first start having meetings with these people, you need to know what they care about. So listening is always a good skill to have. But once you've worked that out, then the question is, how do you align the security things that you're doing or that you want to do to their their goals? One of the things that you can do is understand 
the difference between what's going on operationally in the organization versus what are major initiatives going on in the organization. And typically people have short-term memories. So they're going to be really focused on the programs and the, the day-to-day operational things, unless it's unless security is causing problems in the day-to-day, they're not going to be thinking too much about those things. So I would encourage you to think about what are the major initiatives that these leaders have on their plates? It could be growing membership. It could be um, increasing the amount of the research activities that are going on at the university. It could be um, standing up a new website for taxpayers to engage with your particular department. It could be any of those things. Are there things that you could see that would from a security perspective, benefit those programs? And if so, can you align what you're doing operationally from a security perspective into that program? There's two things that come about that. One, it can make a connection in a leader's mind really quickly about, okay, if I do security well, then this thing that I care about is going to be better. That's one. The other thing is that you can help them understand what the risks and threats of that particular effort are and how security can be protective. So you're giving them two things. You're saying, one, security will benefit you, and two, security will help protect you and protect the value of whatever it is that that they're trying to do. So these can be the ways that you can think about. Now, Certainly, some leaders are going to have operational questions and their concerns are going to be operational, not programmatic. That's fine, too. Talk about, you know, if you're teaching kids in classrooms at the K through 12 level or even in the college level, things like how do students engage from an identity management perspective into the classroom? That can be a real benefit in terms of experience that those students are dealing with. And that can be an operational objective as well. So things to think about there. So when you join an organization trying to do security things, one of the things that you need to understand is how does things get done in this organization? What I found is in the private sector, in older, more established organizations, things get done purely because there's a process to get things done. And when that happens, again, your engagement point then is who are the process owners and can you get with those people and then you insert security things into those processes and that's great. What I found in higher education and what I found in working with public sector organizations and K through 12 is there is process. I don't want to suggest that there's not but really the way things get done is based on who the person is in any particular role. When I onboarded into Ohio State about eight years ago, I was fortunate that they one of my onboarding activities was actually I, I got a coach from HR who I met with once a week. And the purpose of that meeting was for her to tell me how things worked at Ohio State because it wasn't obvious by looking at an org chart about how things worked. And it was it was things like, in the leadership meetings at the presidential level, who was an influential voice and who was a less influential voice, right? Those kinds of questions. So as somebody onboards into a new security role at any level, at any level, or an IT role where they're also responsible for security, thinking about your organization in terms of, you know, who really are the decision makers and who are influential, even if they're not on the org chart as a leader, there are people who are those people that everybody else looks to to go, is that a good idea? Is that not a good idea? Find those people and make friends with those people, take them to lunch, let them know who you are, find a way to find out what's important to them and find a way to align security stuff. It feels squishy, which can be really frustrating for people who are trying to do things programmatically, but you're going to have to get used to it because those are the people that get things done. And if you want to get things done, you're going to have to align to them too. So identifying gaps in a program or in a team can be a little, it's a never ending process. (laughs) First of all, it's, you're never going to be one and done. What I like to suggest to security leaders is that they look at their program through three or four different viewpoints. One is there is always a compliance mandate. And I call that jacks for openers. It is 
if we do nothing else, we have to be doing these compliance related things. And the compliance related things are going to depend on the kind of data your organization holds um, and the kind of work that the organization does. So if you're holding personally identifiable information in the state of Ohio, there are certain things that you need to make sure that you're doing. Do you have an incident response process? Do you have a way of evaluating your technology for vulnerabilities and so forth? So if you've got one hour and one dollar to spend and you've got nothing else, you've pretty much got to start with compliance. Now, I know compliance does not equal security, but it's the kind of stuff that if you get it wrong, there are damages involved. Whereas with almost anything else, if you get it wrong, you're not going to have that kind of stuff. So one, start with compliance. Two, then start with what I would call cyber hygiene, which is an overused term, but there are certain functions that if you're saying you're doing security, people expect you to be doing them. Again, incident response is a thing. Um, vulnerability management is a thing. Um, identity management, certainly this sort of question of how do people log in? Are they using multi-factor? Is, is that interface between students and your organization or faculty or employees, is that a secure linkage? It doesn't mean the security team has to be doing it, but is it being done somewhere in the organization, right? So what are, and, and oh, by the way, asset management, right? Do we know what we have? Do we know where our data is and so forth, right? So one, compliance. Two, do you have the basics in place? Then three, and this sounds counterintuitive, taking a risk-based approach. Where do you have threats and do the things that you have in place line up to address those primary threats? If not, then you need to make sure that you've got those functions. So if you think ransomware, for example, is a threat, do you have email security controls? Do you have multi-factor authentication? Have you trained your employees on how to identify suspicious looking phishing, whether that's through email or whether that's through text or however they're doing it these days, right? So do you have an endpoint detection response capability on your endpoint so that when somebody does get something malicious in their, on their device, you may have a chance of identifying it. So all of these things build on top of one another, by the way. So, you know, thinking about those things in that way, um, from a team perspective too, security can get really overwhelming. So do you have people who are single points of failure? If so, you may want to think about giving them, getting them help, finding other people who can get trained up on what they do, even if they don't do it as a day-to-day -day job, that kind of thing. Um, these are these things you need to be thinking about if you're putting together a program, a security program for an organization. When you're trying to move a security program forward, leadership will often ask you, what is everyone else doing in this space? Is what you're asking for reasonable compared to our peers? Are you, are you asking for more than other people want and so forth? So one of the things that you're going to need to have in your back pocket is information about how other people in the industry are doing it and how other people who look a little bit like you are doing it. Now, it can be really challenging to find a peer organization that actually represents a, an equivalency to what you're doing. What Ohio State does is different than what the University of Miami does or what Ohio University does. What the Department of you know, Underwater Basket Weaving does is different than what the Department of kite flying does, right? It, it, they're still federal agencies or government or state or local agencies, but how they work are, is really contextual to the customers and the communities they're supporting, how big they are and so forth, right? So it, it can be really hard to, to get an, an apples to apples kind of benchmark, but benchmarks can be really important. So go and look at communities that organizations that support your community in higher ed it could be something like educores uh in state and local government it could be something like uh, nasio there's usually these kinds of organizations that have already done the work of doing some kind of benchmarking around security spend types of functions that are being done in these organizations um 
that kind of stuff, right? Even at the K through 12 level, in terms of curriculum, you could look at something like code.org that has done state-by-state evaluations of where we're teaching computer science in a in a K through 12 organization. And um, short story there, only 42% of US high schools are offering at least one computer science class. So as we think about computer science and cybersecurity training, you know, if you're not even offering a computer science class, it might be premature to be thinking about specifically a computer a, a cybersecurity class, right? But could you incorporate cybersecurity principles into computer science curricula, right? So all of which is to say there are lots of opportunities for benchmarking but none of them are going to be completely relevant to your organization. So you need to take those benchmarks and say, I know what the universe of my world looks like compared to other people, but this is what you need to know about us, right? And you need to personalize it for your organization. One of the things that security people are always under pressure to do is to show that they're using the resources they have as wisely as possible. So what does that mean for people who are running a security program or a security organization? One is whatever you're doing, you need to be measuring how effective that thing is. And you need to be willing to to recognize that if the thing isn't living up to expectations in terms of its effectiveness, then that might be something that you stop doing in favor of something else. The reality for us in the security space is that there is not one singular security thing that that is going to solve all of your security problems, right? There is no security silver bullet. What is ultimately effective is a combination of all the things that you're doing or that your organization is doing. If you're the one person shop doing security for your organization, it's not just what are you doing, it's it's collectively what's the entire organization doing and what does that look like. This means that measuring it, you need to have a functional measurement of the activity. It could be how many people are reporting fish into your uh, security operations team. It might be how many people are not using a strong password. It could be how many applications are not behind single sign-on. It could be a whole bunch of things like that. But you need to be measuring those individual functional effectiveness. And then as the leader, you need to also be bringing it all together and saying, in total, is my security program being effective? And where you find things that are not, don't be afraid to cut them out. Because if that one functional thing isn't being effective, you can redeploy those assets to something that is still achieving what you're trying to achieve programmatically, but is more effective in doing it. And it's okay to say this thing that I was doing last week, which I told everybody was super important because I thought it was, well, now we've looked at it and the way we're doing it in our organization is not what we thought it would be. So we're going to redeploy those assets in a more effective way. That's still a really strong message to give to the organization. We all know that if you go to a movie and the movie is bad, you're not going to go see the movie again and you're probably not going to go and see other movies that that person did, whether producer, director, actor or whatever. Like if, if they're bad, they're, ugh, it's a thing. In the security world, when you're dealing with security stakeholders, you need to be able to give them a story that makes them feel good. You need to get to their emotion more than their intellect. So. You need to tell a story that isn't just a point in time. It it does them no good to go to know how many incidents you had this quarter. Like, okay, well, they can't do anything about the incidents you had and you're not giving them anything that they can grab hold of in terms of what they can do in, in the future. So you need to give a story that, one, activates their emotions, that makes them feel good about what you're doing and what they're doing and their role within it. And two, puts them on a journey because every good story has an arc to it. Where did we begin? What was the challenge? How did we overcome the challenge? What was the outcome? This sort of narrative arc is something that we need to be doing as we tell the story about security. So if you're coming in to an organization brand new, the story might just be beginning. So the story is 
hey, I'm learning about this world. I am learning about what we do, how we do it, what's working, what's not working. And I intend to take the stuff that's working and make it even better and the stuff that's not working and find another place for it, right? That might be your introductory story. If you've been doing this thing for a while, now you're in a much better position. You can say to them, hey, look where we've come. Look where we want to go. Look and see how we're making that journey, right? And this is your role within that journey, giving us resources or allowing parts of your organization to partner with us or whatever the situation is. So you want to be telling this story. It wants to be largely a positive story, even if it's bad news. We'll talk about that later. But that story does have to be backed up by data. You can't just make it fiction. It has to be based on something that's real. So this is where, again, your metrics and reporting engines, however they come about, need to inform the story. And it's okay every now and again saying, Ooh, we, we were hitting a dark and stormy night and we're going to have to get through it. That's fine. But your story then that you tell them is, hey, we were going along, we hit a bump, We had a problem, but lucky for us, we're on our way out and this is how we're getting out of it. And there's going to be rainbows ahead, right? So we need to be able to, again, tell it in that way, whether it's a board, whether it's your CEO, whether it's the head of your department, or even whether it's your team, you need to be taking your team along on that same journey. So the story you tell isn't just a story for leadership. It's the story you're always telling the entire organization. Super important. So, If you've never spoken to somebody before and the first thing you get to share with them is bad news, that's really tough. So how do you share bad news? You establish trust before you have to share bad news. How do you do that? Establishing trust is, first of all, making sure that you've got a relationship with the people you're going to have to share bad news with. Maybe you've got a board who you know you're going to have to report to, or maybe you've got a governance group that is made up of leadership across your organization. And you know, they are the people that if something bad goes wrong, you're going to have to talk to those people too. Maybe it's your legal support. Maybe it's a vendor that you're going to outsource stuff to, whatever. Number one, you've got to set up a relationship with those people first. You've got to let them know that that you know what's important to them, but also that you're competent to be able to captain the organization through an incident, whatever that incident looks like. So establishing trust is really important. Well, how do you do that? One, meet with them early, on board for new leaders as they come on board. Make sure that you're part of the conversation that that says to them, this is how we do security. This is your role in doing security. If we have an incident, this is your role. Do that early, right? And then throughout the year, make sure that you're giving them information that helps them understand how security really works in the real world. The real world is for most of us, if you have an incident, you'll survive it and it'll be fine. If you have even a really bad ransomware attack, you'll get through it and that's fine. How do you let them know that? Well, you give them examples of other organizations that are doing the same thing. Even something like the solar winds and the colonial pipeline breaches, guess what? Those organizations are still with us. They've recovered to some degree. Did they experience pain? Yes, but they got through it, right? So on a monthly basis, help people understand what's happening in your industry. Where are you seeing other state, local, K-12, higher ed, whatever organizations? What are they doing about it? What are we doing about it in knowing that that's going on, right? So ransomware event happens with this school. We took a look at it. We saw what that hap- what, what was involved, how we might mitigate that threat oh, look, we're implementing it in our our own programs, right? So giving them that constant sort of update and education about the state of the state in the industry and that you're aware of it and that you're helping the organisation manage to those concerns is going to help them feel better. Then when the things come about that are bad, oops, we had a data loss, oops, we had a ransomware event, whatever, then what you're saying to them is, look, we knew this was going to happen. Not that we were accepting of it, we were taking steps to prevent it, but this is how we're going to recover from it. That's okay. That's okay to do that kind of thing. And that's how you talk about it when, because inevitably something's going to happen sooner or later. So let them know it's coming ahead of time.
one of the things we know in higher ed and public sector and K through 12 is that a singular security person cannot ensure that the entire organization is secure. So one of the things that we have to do is to be able to help people upskill their security skills in the roles they are they are in already, particularly people who are in IT related roles. And when you're thinking about your budget to do that, you probably have a budget of like hardly anything, right? Zero, zero to maybe less than $100 per headcount if you're lucky. So, so what do you do then? Well, the good news is there are a lot of organizations that have faced this issue. And there are a lot of organizations who've developed materials that can be taken advantage of without an outlay of cost to actually do the training. It, it is almost impossible to send all of your IT people to SANS training where it's going to cost you $4,000 a boot camp to do it. So what can you do? There is a whole bunch of LinkedIn learning that is available and a lot of organizations have made it available for free for nonprofits and for, uh, for, for public sector organizations. We know our local libraries are offering LinkedIn licenses for free, right? So we can think about that kind of training or Udemy training, or even there's a whole bunch of stuff out on YouTube, OSU notwithstanding, that is already free for the community. We're also seeing federal agencies like the FCC and CESA have websites that have resources that are freely available that are really specifically targeted actually to government working people, like to, to the public sector working people. So going to their websites and checking out what's available, we're seeing the Department of Education offering, in partnership with CESA, offering curricula for uh, cybersecurity curricula K through 12 and higher education. So instructors don't have to create stuff from scratch. It's already there and it's already available. So thinking about all of those kinds of resources, okay, as an organisation then, the training cost is free, except that you've got to give your employees the time to go and do it. The good news is that if you do this, your employees are going to feel like you're investing in them. They're going to feel like they have opportunities perhaps to move into a security career goal or career path that they may not already be in. So it allows them to get some expansion in their own career prospects that they may not have had before. So thinking about those kinds of things. And oh, by the way, a lot of that training is continuous education credits for teachers, for IT folks who already have certifications and so forth. So there is a there is a community win in investing and pointing your staff particularly your IT staff, towards that kind of training that benefits them personally, but is also going to benefit the organisation itself. So one of the things that happens is every now and again, you actually do need money. Like you need cold, hard cash to get things done. And particularly when you're in the public sector, that can be really sort of tough to try and work that out. There, there's certainly more flexibility when you're in the private sector. Um, so how do you think, how can you think about that? The first thing is that there is actually a lot of um, focus right now from the federal, state and local government areas in terms of cybersecurity. They're recognizing this is really a public good, that there needs to be policy initiatives around to address. So there are grants that are coming through, particularly from CESA, um, from uh, from the infrastructure bill that was signed last year, from the COVID bill, there are still funds available through that. So one of the things, if you're in uh, in public sector, understand what grant opportunities are available to you and how to take advantage of them. I know it's government, there are lots of strings attached, but sometimes the effort can be worth it. That would be one thing. Second, there are a lot of, Nonprofit uh, organizations that are looking to do things for the public sector community and for higher ed and for organizations that are below the poverty line. Um, so look for those kinds of organizations. Again, they may have one time grants, which doesn't help you with ongoing operational costs, but might allow you to move some funds around to take advantage of that too. Three, 
take a look at the vendors you already have, your IT vendors, your um, HR vendors that do training. A lot of them are starting to offer services in addition to the products that you've bought or the subscriptions you've made that go over and above but are not at an additional cost that could help you come in and do training and awareness. It could help you come in and maybe um, look at tuning the tools you've already purchased so you get more out of them from a cybersecurity perspective. And they may be willing to offer you some cash to pilot something new. We know that a lot of the security products that are made are made with the commercial sector in, and private sector in mind, and they're not always exactly fit for purpose for public sector, higher ed, K through 12. So if you've got a use case that is specific for you, that isn't addressed with the tools that you have, go to your vendors and say, let's co-invest in doing this for a pilot for a year and seeing if that can come out and help you out. And of course, universities are a great place to do partnerships with as well. So can you do an internship with partnership with a community college or a high school senior class or uh, go figure a university that's going to help you maybe get more resources? And yeah, they're more junior resources, but I have to tell you when I had the internship program at Ohio State, our interns did amazing work. So Leverage those opportunities as well. It's not just about the budget you have. It's about being creative, looking for additional sources of resource of, of funding that's out there for you. Cybersecurity and cybersecurity risk has been around for a really long time, like decades, if not centuries at this point, really. Like people like computers, yeah, even before computers, cybersecurity had elements of risk in it, right? We haven't solved for it yet. We're not going to solve for it for a long time. So the only way for us to be collectively secure is if we engage collectively in solving common problems. So as you think about where to go from here, think about the communities that we have here, the one that Ohio State's created, but there are communities across Ohio. There are communities across education. There's communities across public sector. All of those organizations and communities have people that have already walked this path for a while. So look for those people, make connections to them, take them out for coffee, have a Zoom session with them, whatever you need to do. But get involved in the community. It will make your day-to-day -day job easier because you will not have to reinvent the wheel. Every time I go to a new organization, I'm actually dealing with the same problems and same concerns and same threats that I dealt with in the communities I've come from and the organizations I've come from. You will find the same thing. So don't feel like you've got to go it alone. Be part of the community, add your voice, be active, and you will get more than what you give. I promise you.